But friends, you know things got serious when I have a fresh cut like this one. As you've probably heard, the Russian army has launched an offensive north of Kharkiv Oblast. Here from The Economist, Ukraine's defenders anxiously dig in for a looming Russian assault. The New York Times, Russian attacks open a new front in Ukraine. Long story short, Russia achieved in four days with a couple of battalions with no combat experience. What Ukraine painfully gained in three months with an entire NATO-trained battle corps. We also remember the continuous Ukrainian incursions across the border towards Belgorod. Well, you know what, you can only tickle the bear so much before he starts getting mad. The entire Western media was mocking Russia's May 9th Victory Day parade. Surprise, surprise, the next day Russia launches an offensive. That's how dozens of tactical units infiltrated the border and pushed through Ukrainian lines like a hot knife through butter. Like this Ukrainian soldier told the BBC, the Russians simply walked in. What happened? This place was supposed to have been fortified. The Ukrainians have been speaking about this offensive for weeks and weeks and they still got clapped. Through a series of attacks, the Russian armed forces established two breachheads. And remember how on the 11th of September 2022, the Russian troops, humiliated by a disastrous campaign, were chased out of Vovchansk. Well, now Russian detachments are already fighting on the outskirts of that same Vovchansk. And according to the latest news, Russian assault detachments are already moving into the city center. In response, the Ukrainians redeployed a lot of battalions to the northern front, hoping to halt this disastrous Russian operation meant to destroy the rear. But like you can see in this video, the situation remains critical. If you're confused behind the real intent behind this offensive, well, that's exactly the point. Many articles like this one from Forbes reported that it was just an elaborate feint. Will Ukraine fall for it? What most people fail to understand is that a proper diversion must be made believable. A proper diversion is an attack you cannot ignore. And that's exactly what we're witnessing. If Ukraine sends reinforcements to Kharkiv, this will hurt their defense of the Donbass front. If they ignore it, Russia's limited scale offensive could turn into something much more dangerous. From an operational perspective, the Russian army is less than 20 kilometers away from Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. You know what, Kharkov, Miet, Bliat, I mean Kharkiv, is not strategically important anyway. Welcome to History Legends and here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian war. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. So for weeks, even months, there were a lot of rumors and anticipation about a planned Russian operation against the north of Kharkiv Oblast. I personally did not believe that the Russian armed forces were ready to commit that many forces against Kharkiv so soon, especially with the blooming front near Donetsk. Reason number one was because the victory condition for the Russian army is to capture Donbass. No Donbass, no victory. And reason number two, there were simply not enough Russian troops north of Kharkiv to actually storm the city. The Ukrainians estimated the Russian force deployed along the northern border to be separated into three contingents. Group Bryansk with 8,500 men, Group Kursk with 10,800, and the larger group Bielgorod, composed of the 44th Army Corps with approximately 31,000 troops. For an estimated total of 50,000 Russian soldiers spread across 400 kilometers. Even worse, that was the strength on paper. Because in reality, only the 72nd Motor Rifle Division of the 44th Army Corps was ready to be activated. At this point, how could someone imagine an actual Russian offensive against Kharkiv? However, speculations increased on May 9th, when it was announced that Colonel General Lapine showed up to provide practical assistance to Group North. <coughs> GG well played, they're actually going in. They won. 
Early on May 10, Army Group North launched a massive artillery barrage on the villages of Hoptivka, Strelecha, Borisivka, Lukianci, Povchansk, Hatishche, Lipci, and Oyersteve. A Ukrainian platoon commander told the Times, It was silent, then it was hell. Now from the perspective of the Ukrainian command, with all these positions under a massive artillery barrage, what do you do? Not only did the Russians bombard frontline positions, but they also made sure to destroy Ukraine's ability to respond. Here a Russian Lancet hit a self-propelled gun near Borchova. In this video, it's a Ukrainian M777 that was put out of action in Olinikovi. And lastly, in this one, Russian artillery destroyed a warehouse in Vovchansk, used as deployment point by the Ukrainian army. That's when small Russian tactical units crossed the border and fighting flared up in numerous settlements. Meanwhile, a smaller grouping attacked 25 kilometers to the east towards Khatishche. By the way, notice how the Russians painted a new tactical symbol on their vehicles, a diamond with an X. Some think it's an acronym for Kharkovskaya Oblast or Kharkov Oblast. X. Oh, others believe it's actually the rune of Gungnir, the spear of the god Odin, which Varangian warriors painted on their shields. But I think it's just XO for hugs and kisses. It's very likely the first line of defense right at the border was only lightly fortified, and thus did not allow the defenders to effectively stand their ground and push back the enemy. That's how the units of the Ukrainian 42nd Mechanized Brigade got slapped in the sector of Pilna. There was little they could do against swarms of Russian light infantry units and armed vehicles attacking left and right around their position. Yes, they did inflict a number of casualties, but they did not stop the Russians. You might have stumbled on this video where you see a Russian squad pass through a friendly column of five burnt vehicles that were abandoned. This was geolocated right here at the entry of the settlement. However, it was not enough to halt the enemy, as Russian soldiers were soon geolocated beyond the village of Pilna. A handful of Ukrainian soldiers were also captured in the early hours of this surprise attack. Soon enough, the Russians progressed another two kilometers towards Olinikove. But this is where another of their armored columns got completely hammered, with a bunch of vehicles destroyed or abandoned. Ukrainian positions around Morohovets and Olinikovi held strong, mainly due to the fact that this sector was more fortified than the others, with strong points and trench networks like this one spread out left and right. It could also be that, according to the fortifications map, that the Ukrainians actually expected a Russian attack along the axis strelitsha lipci Anyway, a Russian detachment simply ended up bypassing the Ukrainian strongholds. Reportedly, certain Ukrainian units panicked and abandoned their positions, which allowed the Russians to capture a few settlements. This is a clear resulting effect of Ukraine's lack of manpower. Reportedly, Ukraine only lost 31,000 soldiers KIA, but now they urgently need half a million replacements. At the end of day one of the offensive, on the western side, Russian forces managed to capture four villages in advance four kilometers. Meanwhile, on the eastern side, they progressed four kilometers as well and captured two villages. Yet, we still could not talk about a major Russian offensive being carried out. Ukrainian reports mentioned an attack force consisting of four to five battalions, or equivalent to a contingent of 2,000 soldiers belonging to the 30th Motorized Rifle Regiment and 128th Motorized Rifle Brigade. Apparently, behind them was a second wave of 2,000 soldiers, and apparently the 44th Corps could activate another 4,000 men over the next week. To me, the only explanation was that the Russian army launched a reconnaissance in force mission to probe Ukrainian defenses. It's probing time. On top of that, most attack vectors consisted of light infantry columns like this one, at best supported by a couple armored vehicles. But we were not seeing any major armored assaults like the ones we were witnessing along the Donetsk front. My hypothesis at this point was that this operation was Maskerovka in full effect. Russia saw an opportunity or weakening of the enemy line of defense. In turn, they activated the newly created division right at the border to cause chaos and pin down as many Ukrainian troops as possible away from the main battlefields. 
as the Russian troops were penetrating Ukrainian rear-end positions left and right. Ukraine was coping hard by putting out claims of inflicting massive losses on the enemy. They also urgently deployed their elite Photoshop battalion to add Group North tactical symbols on a bunch of old pictures they had on their USB. Did it work? We are winning! Day 2. On the 11th of May, the Russians attacked on four new axes. In a way, their diversion operation itself was composed of diversionary attacks to hide the main axis of attack. This is what I'm telling you when the Russians are expert at deception, as the Russian spearheads started creating a united front. The Ukrainian command urgently transferred units of the 57th Motorized and 92nd Assault Brigade plus the Kraken Regiment to stabilize the situation. Some talk of a total of six battalions transferred from the Kherson and Zaporozhye fronts. In total, we could be looking at a Ukraine grouping of 4,000 soldiers, plus X amount of troops in reserve. What am I saying? This already includes reinforcements. Here's what a reconnaissance platoon commander of the 1st Battalion, 57th Motorized Brigade, called Yaroslavsky, had to say. The first line and the so-called front line, of course, it is maintained by the units, equipped by the units themselves. Unfortunately, there is no possibility to talk about the use of heavy equipment and reinforced concrete structures. On day two, a Russian push dislodged the Ukrainians from the villages of Morohovets and Olinikove. As you can see with this footage of a Russian squad calmly walking along the main road south of the settlement. Some reports even mentioned that forward elements of the Russian army had already reached the outskirts of Lipsy, meaning they were only 17 kilometers north of Kharkiv. However, it's really on the eastern sector that things turned up. At once, entire Russian units crossed the border and stormed out of these forests. The entire greenery camouflaged their entire attacking force, and this allowed the Russian group north to greatly expand the breachhead they had established on day one. For example, this Ukrainian drone took footage of at least three Russian armored vehicles geolocated south of the settlement of Ohirsteve. Meanwhile, in Hatishche, the Russians managed to control the western half of the village. From there, according to a new wave of reports, and especially after this picture was released, it was understood that some Russian recon units arrived on the outskirts of Vovchansk. Meanwhile, other detachments positioned further east approached the area between Vovchansk and Vovchansky Hotori. By the way, the bridge linking the two settlements was targeted and destroyed by the Russians thus impacting Ukraine's ability to redeploy reinforcements. However, by 2 p.m. on the 11th of May, Vovchansk was still under Ukrainian control according to this video. Now be ready, the next video is pretty crazy. Six kilometers to the west, this Ukrainian drone spotted a company of over 100 Russian riflemen in compact formation coming out of these woods. To me, the way these guys move and deploy into combat, brings another point to the fact that these units are fresh out of the training ground. I mean, look at that, they're not even spread out. A couple rounds of cluster munitions and the entire company is gone. This detachment pushed out of this forest along this gap east of Staritsia, and thus bringing the battle to Bohuvatka. To make things even more difficult for Ukraine, a Russian airstrike destroyed the Staristaltiv dam over the Donetsk river. Once again, this is another step into isolating Vovchansk and making it harder for Ukraine to maintain logistics lines between Kharkiv and Vovchansk. We can clearly see that there was a plan to encircle Vovchansk from all directions. A strike right at the center to pin down the Ukrainians on the northern side of the Vovcha river, with a smaller pincer from the east side, plus a wide flanking maneuver from the west side. According to the latest geolocations of May 12th, Russian forces have captured Borovatka and everything up to the Donetsk river. From there, the Russians could storm Prilipka, using this bridge to cross the river. Now if the bridge is kaput, all they need is a couple of inflatable boats to cross this 40 meter wide water barrier. From there they could push forward and cut the T-2404 road linking Vovchansk and Staryseltiv, leaving only one viable exit for Ukrainian forces. Day 3. On the 12th of May, these Russian soldiers from an unidentified unit declared full control over the settlement of Hatishche. Meanwhile, these Chechen soldiers pose in front of a World War II Soviet memorial in Ohirsteve. 
This means with Ohirstevi and Hatice secured, the Russian troops were only two kilometers away from Vovchansk, and they were slowly surrounding the Ukrainian-held town. Now it was really important for Ukraine to hold their ground at all costs because the loss of Vovchansk would be extremely problematic. Because this urban area would be a perfect staging ground for phase two of this Russian operation along the Donetsk River. The Ukraine command estimated that the Russian attack force in this sector consisted of four to five battalions. This also reinforces the idea of a reconnaissance in force. On the western bridgehead, a Russian unit was spotted two kilometers south of Pilna, approaching the settlement of Lukyansky. Meanwhile, another detachment crossed the border and pushed towards Zelene. Notice how on the east side the Russians mainly pushed out of forested areas for camouflage, but on the western end they pushed in open terrain, probably because they could easily pin down and crush isolated enemy bastions with artillery. But like this Ukrainian soldier told the BBC, the Russians managed to push through because there were not even any minefields to stop them. Meanwhile, there were still Ukrainian defenses composed of small trenches hidden in the dense greenery here, here, and here. For now, the Russian detachment simply bypassed them. But if they want to truly consolidate their breachheads, they will need the reinforcements of the second wave to clear all these positions. Overall, at the end of day three, the Russian command managed to unite all its attack vectors into two major breachheads over a 45 kilometer front. Because of this Russian offensive, Ukraine replaced Yuri Garushkin, the commander in charge of the defense of Kharkiv, with Brigadier General Mikhail Drapati. So we said there were four to five battalions operating around Vovchansk. Perhaps there were one or two additional battalions operating on the flanks, plus an equal amount on the western sector. So we could say this Russian operation involved up to 15 battalions. Surprise, surprise, roughly equal to the strength of a Russian motorized rifle division, or 30% of Group Belgorod. Other sources claim that up to 40% of the grouping was already involved in the Kharkiv operation, or 12,000 troops. Once again, this seems to confirm the theory that we're probably witnessing a reconnaissance in force by the Russian 72nd Motorized Rifle Division to test enemy defenses and its ability to transfer reinforcements. Now, if the main objective of the Russian army was to divert as many troops from the Eastern Front up to the North, then it's mission accomplished. This limited scale offensive is already hurting rotations all along the Donetsk front. Now imagine if they slap Kharkiv with a girthy one. Day 4 To repulse Russian forces, Ukraine reportedly transferred additional units of the 60th and 63rd Mechanized Brigade plus artillery units of the 45th Brigade from the Liman sector northwards towards Kharkiv and Sumy. All this because of the infiltration of a couple Russian detachments with no combat experience. As you can see with these FPV drone strikes, Ukrainian drone operators mainly faced isolated infantry squads, some of which established themselves in abandoned Ukrainian trench lines. Nonetheless, with additional reinforcements, Russian forces continued their push and stormed the village of Lukyansi. Another Russian detachment did the same with the village of Hryboke. You can even see the flag that was raised over that settlement. On the western sector, the next move will most likely be to converge towards Lipsy. If the Russians bring some of their immediate reserves in that sector, this could be combined with a flanking maneuver via Neskuchne and Vesele to force the Ukrainians to withdraw even further and essentially bring the battle right on the outskirts of Kharkiv. Apparently, the Russians are currently in the process of clearing up all these positions in between both breachheads. On the eastern flank, Russian units got a foothold inside the northern outskirts of Vovchansk. And guess who was there to stop them? The pro-Ukrainian Russian Volunteer Corps. The guys that were bragging of having encircled Bielgorod. Ha ha ha, now Bielgorod encircles you. Anyway, we know that the RDK was active because of this video, where we see one of their armored vehicles firing along the main road at enemy troops. And this event was geolocated right here on the map. For now, we're seeing Russian units of the Group North converging on Vovchansk from the north, east, and west. At the same time, the Russians destroyed this other bridge over the Vovcha River. If they do the same to these two other bridges, all the Ukrainian troops on the northern side of the Vovcha River will be cut off. As of May 14th, or day 5 of the operation, Russian light infantry units are clearing the northern sectors of Vovchansk, combined with a flanking maneuver towards Tiche. 
in turn, if the Ukrainians are unable to counterattack and push the Russians back to the border, the Ukrainians could be forced to withdraw south of the Vovcha River and establish a new defensive line there with their left flank protected by the Donetsk River. Now, in the worst case scenario, if the Russians not only take the northern part of Vovchansk, but also cross the river and take the southern part, well, then they could push along both banks of the Donetsk River up to Starisaltiv. And this could be done with a relatively small contingent like they've done up until now. Now, we know they only have a couple of thousands of soldiers left in reserve, meaning only a few days of combat operations. Mostly, this is all the Russian army can achieve at this moment. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below.